Jen Wood from the Center for War and Justice. Thank you, Kaja. Okay, I gotta get myself together here for a moment. That was a lot uh, and very real. So, let me take a breath. I want to thank Connie and Anna today for sharing the stories about their families. I want to talk for a minute about who is affected by the invisible wall because I think that the invisible wall is much more powerful and much more painful than any other wall that keeps get, getting talked about in the media because its effect is real, it's immediate, it's happening today while we sit here. It's not about bickering over some structure that would be built elsewhere. Um, and we want to really think about for a minute who is really affected because in a, in a sense, in a sense that I think most Americans are unwilling recognize we are all in mixed status families. Um, you know, I'm kind of this stereotype of who would be not affected by the invisible wall. You know, Anglo, middle class, middle age, um, native born, white lady who's protected by many, many layers of privilege. In my family, we, there are three branches of a nuclear family that currently contain individuals who are today or previously undocumented. So just let that sink in for a minute. I'm not talking about six cousins twice removed. I'm talking about children, grandchildren, partners, in-laws. So I think that most Americans are very naive in their understanding of who is affected by the invisible law. Because we are all in mixed status families. Most people don't wish to acknowledge that, and because of the fear and pressure surrounding that issue, most families do not discuss it. So it's both an invisible wall and it's a wall of silence. So I want to be a role model here today to say, take down the invisible wall, take down the wall of silence. Families are intimidated from discussing these issues even within the family. Connie had to confront her own parents as an adult to say, what is my story? What's really going on with this? So I think that until we all confront that, that the status that we all have in mixed families, then we're not going to bring this issue home to policymakers and to others to really make some more fundamental changes. So not only is everyone in Rhode Island affected economically, and I want to thank Alan for that very excellent overview, but people are affected personally in ways that they're not willing to acknowledge. One of the things that we at the Center for Justice have been doing with the Immigrant Coalition in the last year, year and a half, is talking about families in terms of how can families be protected and prepared uh, given this onslaught of very painful and negative policies in the current administration. And so uh, we really, as a coalition, put together materials for families where there may be children in the family who are born in the United States, but where the parents may face deportation or detention. And so one of the key things that the Immigrant Coalition has organized around and put in place is family preparedness planning. Uh, and I want to give a particular shout out to the United Way Thank you, Kyle, because the coalition, <laughs> the coalition was able to receive a small grant to work on this issue of having family preparedness materials that would be available to everyone. And we now have those materials up. They're available on the uh, Economic Progress Institute website. They're on the website at our center, and hopefully soon will be linked to the websites of every one of the 35 organizations in the Immigrant Coalition. Um, because while we have done road shows with several of the people that you see here on the dais um, to go and speak with families, help them to make these plans, the most important and powerful thing I think that was aided by um, what the United Way made us able to do was to make these materials available on the web so that in privacy of your own home, from any location, an immigrant family with concerns about how to 
make sure that their children will be provided for and cared for in the worst case scenario in which a parent is detained or deported. They can do that without fear, without attending a meeting, without going into a public space, but can do that from any location where they feel safe. Uh, and just a brief sketch for those of you who work with immigrant families in their day jobs. Uh, basically, we've put in place a series of materials that families can complete that will give them an alternative caregiver designated by them, selected by them for their child or children if they are unable to care for their child due to detention or deportation. So there are really three domains in which that documentation is needed in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, we don't have a single designation. Um, some states have passed legislation, which is something I think we should be thinking about in the coming year, that creates a designation of caregiver for particularly this circumstance. But in Rhode Island, we really needed to account for educational decision making, healthcare decision making, and then general economic and custodial care. So we put together materials, a broad group of people worked on this project to have forms that are hopefully somewhat simple to understand, although because they need to be legally effective, they're a little bit complicated. But basically, a family can have a conversation, think about who within the broader network of the family would be available to care for U.S. born children in the event of a deportation or detention of a parent. Um, we give some information about how to think about the criteria for such a caregiver. Obviously, the, the preference is for a caregiver who themselves has uh, stable immigrant status in the United States or is a U.S. citizen. Uh, because rather than having to go through serial changes, um, it's best to try and identify a family member or a family friend who has citizenship or a green card in order to be the alternate caregiver in the event of detention or deportation. Uh, and of course, to think about all of the issues about the emotional support to the children, about the trauma that will occur if there is the need to use those documents and to really think about all the layers of that. But fundamentally, um, there are two goals for this project. One is to give people the ability to access these materials so that they can feel that they do have a plan in place. And secondly, so that children will not be left in a circumstance where there is no designated caregiver, where in the worst case scenario, that could involve children being placed in foster care or in the care of the state. So we've also worked with partners at DCYF to have them understand the project, to understand that family designated caregivers using these forms are valid legal designations that will enable an aunt or a cousin or a very trusted family friend to take on the caregiver role in the event that children are left without a parent uh, to care for them. So I really recommend that any of you medical students, others, anyone who's working with immigrants in any capacity, go on the, go on the uh, website for the Economic Progress Institute, go on our website, familiarize yourself with the materials. It's not just the forms that are there, but an explanation of the forms that's available in English and in Spanish. Uh, and so we, we are very uh, grateful for all of our partners to be able to make these forms available. And we really believe that every immigrant family in Rhode Island, and actually every family in Rhode Island, should have these forms in place because there are other reasons why biological parents may become unavailable to their children, even in non-immigrant families. So having that thoughtful process of having an alternate caregiver designated for your children is just a good thing for every family to have in place. We also want to uh, and work every day to make sure that immigrants understand that they have legal rights in other contexts. So Linda mentioned that at the Center for Justice, we actually don't do visas. We don't do representation in immigration court. But we re represent immigrants in so many other areas of their lives where they need that support. So in housing, in terms of opposing evictions, in terms of uh, advocating for safe and healthy conditions in low-income rental apartments through code enforcement and other mechanisms, through bringing affirmative action in the courts to require landlords to meet basic health and safety standards in rented apartments. Um, looking at issues in employment, a lot of immigrants have been 
exploited and intimidated by their employers to not understand their legal rights in the workplace. Immigrants have the same legal rights to uh, receive the minimum wage, to receive overtime payments, all the wage and hour laws apply, all of the workers' compensation laws apply. This is something that we really are very passionate about, making sure that immigrants understand that they do have rights, um, the same rights as other residents in Rhode Island in the employment context. Um, and then also in the schools, and you're going to hear from Sarah about some of the issues that families confront in the schools and how educators are really needing to become much more aware and sophisticated about these issues. The United States Supreme Court has ruled unequivocally that all immigrant children, including undocumented immigrant children, have a right to attend the public schools and have a right to attend the public schools without fear or intimidation at the schoolhouse door. Um, so those are also a set of important issues that we are hoping to assist families in and making sure that it's in each of the, those domains of their lives that immigrant families feel supported and protected. There are boundaries, there are limitations to what we can do in some circumstances, but the first point is that immigrant families who are living in fear, who may be exploited in the workplace, who may feel intimidated at school, who may not understand how to make a plan to care for their children in the event of detention or deportation, should be informed that there are people available to assist, that there are resources available to them. This should, this should not be a situation in which people feel powerless and hopeless because uh, our message to you today is that there are people working on these issues and that we would be grateful and proud if you refer people to us to assist them with the other civil legal matters, not their immigration status, um, and our wonderful partners at Thorpe's Clinic and in other settings are focusing on the immigration.